Welcome to First Baptist Church. It is so good to see you today. If you're not already standing and if you're able to, please stand with us as we start our service with singing. So the announcement I want to share with you today is that we will be having a church picnic 
first Sunday in October at Bumbleberry. And uh, weather provided, a backup would be the following week. And so additional details will be forthcoming, but I wanted you to get that on your calendar. And if you walked in the door, you may have noticed a can out there with a pumpkin on it. That's because we're collecting candy for Pumpkin Fest, which is around the corner and coming quickly. I can't believe it. Um, but it is what it is. And so let's ask the Lord's blessing on today's service. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the beautiful weather that we've been having. Just, just absolutely gorgeous. We are thankful for all your provision to us. We are thankful for what you are doing in and through us. And so we gather together today as one body to give Jesus the praise and the glory and the honor that he is due. We come with grateful hearts. We come with thankful hearts. We come with hearts that are searching for you, looking to meet with you today. Pour your spirit out upon us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue by singing Overcome. Now the darkness fades in the new beginnings as we lift our eyes. To declare the reign of the Lord our God We will not be moved when the earth is away For the risen one is overcome And for every fear there's an empty grave For the risen one is overcome Now the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry and the earth respond. All creation shouts with the joys of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the reason one is overcome And for every fear There's an empty grave For the reason one is overcome He shall Strongholds now surrender for the Lord our God has overcome. Who can be against us? Jesus, our defender, he is Lord and he has overcome. He shall reign forever. Strongholds now surrender for. an empty grave for the risen one is overcome we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is overcome
All right, take a moment, turn to your neighbors this morning, greet them in the Lord today. a seat this morning. Please draw your attention to the video screens. Welcome to EA News. Coming up, we're going to share updates from our staff retreat, ongoing construction of the training center, a completed match offer, inspiring music classes, and the start to our 20th anniversary celebrations. All this and more right after this. three months, we've made great progress at El Ayudante. Let's see some of the highlights from this quarter. In April, our EA staff enjoyed a special retreat. This day was dedicated to pouring into our staff through conferences, team building activities, and fellowship, promoting growth and unity. The retreat was a huge success, filled with teaching, spiritual growth, and fun. Our amazing staff left feeling motivated and ready for the challenges ahead. The construction of our new training center is moving forward rapidly, thanks to the incredible support from our community. Parents, students, teachers, pastors, and our dedicated EA staff all joined to help build this vital facility. Their hard work and enthusiasm are bringing this project to life. 
We are so grateful for everyone's contributions and looking forward to the many, many ways this training center is gonna serve our community. This quarter, we were able to reach our goal with a $100,000 matching offer from the Jackson Kemper Foundation. Thanks to your generous donations, we can continue our important work in general medicine, dentistry, education, trade school classes, and community development. Together, we're building a legacy and making a lasting impact. Our clinic continues to provide essential care to our communities. This quarter, we were blessed with a volunteer who offered specialized eye care, screening all 186 of our scholarship students in addition to his regular patients. The clinic remains a cornerstone of our ministry, offering not only medical services, but also spiritual care, ensuring that every visit is a blessing to both body and soul. We also had another volunteer, Sheila. She's been leading music classes for the past several years, inspiring both church leaders and students in our communities. These classes introduce students to the joy of music while also building up worship leaders in local churches. They ended their classes with a recital to showcase the incredible progress our students have made, where family and friends celebrated their achievements together. We've started celebrating our 20th anniversary with a special video series. These videos feature team members sharing their experiences from their first trips to now, highlighting the lasting impact of EA. If you haven't seen them yet, go check them out on our social media or find the videos on our YouTube channel, El Ayudante Honduras to watch these inspiring stories and join us in celebrating this milestone. We're also marking our 10th anniversary of the medical services in the clinic, showcasing the incredible work of our dedicated partners like Jeff Johnson. So much more has happened already this quarter, including teams projects, distribution of mobility carts, trade school classes, which include welding, beauty and baking, the graduation of our scholarship students, improvements of the Mission House made by our ground crew, delivery of mobile libraries throughout communities, and a marriage course, and our second wedding of the year. Churches in the States have also been raising funds through VBS activities. So much more has already happened this year. Thank you for being a part of all that is happening here in Honduras. For more information, visit us on social media at EA Honduras or on our website at eahonduras.org. Let's stand together one more time before the message and sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation.
Amen. You may have a seat this morning. Do you adore him? When I think of that, I think of Christmas. Three months away. Uh, Snow. (laughs) So, last week's message, we saw how the Apostle Paul said that he and Silas and Timothy all gave thanks for the saints in Thessalonica. Specifically, they gave thanks to God for the work that was produced by faith, for their labor or efforts that was prompted by love, and for their endurance or perseverance inspired by hope. If you were here last week, you would have uh, been aware that I said these are three great indicators on whether or not you have a successful life or we have a successful church. If we produce work as a result of our faith, if all of our efforts in our ministry are prompted by love, if all of our patience or perseverance is produced by our hope. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing last week's message, but I do want to emphasize how important these three aspects of the Christian life are. Faith, hope, and love. They are essential for our life, just like water, soil, and sun are essential for a plant. Now, in today's scripture, Paul offers words of encouragement that are designed to motivate the saints at Thessalonica to continue down the path that they're walking, to continue producing work, that is based on their faith, to continue to make sure that their efforts are motivated by love, to ensure that their endurance and perseverance is inspired by hope. So let's look at this passage of Scripture today, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 7 together. Paul writes, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, in verses 4 and 5, Paul extends a word of assurance and encouragement to the saints, just like he had done in verse 3. Every one of us needs a word of encouragement from time to time, don't we? I mean, we need it in our homes. We need it in our workplace. We need it in the relationships we have with other individuals. We need it in the church. Why? Because encouragement refreshes our souls like a glass of ice-cold water on a hot summer day. Notice how Paul calls the saints at Thessalonica brothers. It's not a reference to gender here. We do know that the church was made up of both male and females, Brothers, not a reference to gender. It is a term of affection. It's a term of endearment. It recognizes the person that you are calling a brother is a child of God, a fellow saint, just like you are a child of God. And then Paul adds this little description to the saints. Not only are they brothers, but they are also brothers loved by God. Loved by God. Now, I don't want us to skip past this too quickly because every human being that I know of, every person that I know of wants to be loved by someone. Human beings are a part of creation that is relational. We were created to love and to be loved. 
Unfortunately, there are those individuals who go through life feeling like they're never loved by anyone. That's, that's just tragic. I can't, I can't experientially relate to that. There'll be some who go through life seeking love in all the wrong places. Sounds like a song. For some, these are legitimate struggles. And those that are in the church are no exception from these struggles. Therefore, one of the greatest ways Paul could have encouraged the saints was to remind them that they are loved by God. Are, do you realize that? You realize you're loved by God? Now, let me be clear about something. I'm not suggesting that, that God just loves those who are in Christ. God loves his entire creation even though it's been twisted as a result of sin. God may express his love in different ways to and through his creation, but the point that is being made is that no one, no one gets to come to Christ apart from being a brother or sister in Christ, apart from the love of God. So if you are in Christ Jesus here, but you're struggling to find love, let me assure you this morning that you are loved. You are loved by the one who is pure love. Perfect love. Not only does Paul know the saints are loved by God, he also knows that as such, they are chosen by God. They're chosen by God. What a great word of encouragement, don't you think? I mean, especially if you are living among a group of individuals who reject what you believe in as well as the individual in whom you believe. As a result, you're either suffering or facing some kind of persecution because of your faith. Chosen by God. Man, what a wonderful thing. It's wonderful to me, even if some may have a problem with the wording here, God's choosing. For some, the idea of choosing brings up the controversy between Calvinism and Arminianism. Who chooses whom? Do we choose God? Does God choose us? Let me tell you, this has absolutely no bearing on Paul's comment because such a, such a controversy would, would not come about for 1,500 years. Paul is simply stating a fact. And this fact is just as true today as when Paul mentioned it to the saints at Thessalonica. He told them that he knows, that we know, him and Silas and Timothy know that the saints are loved by God and are chosen by God. They know it. Now, that could seem kind of like an arrogant statement, don't you think? I mean, how could Paul say he knows? What evidence does he have to support this assumption? Well, the previous verse, verse 3, provides all the evidence that they need. Because the saints at Thessalonica were loved and chosen by God, guess what? They bore fruit, works produced by faith. Their labor or efforts was prompted by love. Their endurance is inspired by hope. Come on, do you need any more evidence? All this is the divine result of being in Christ. It's not a result of human effort. Without being chosen and loved by God, such things could not happen. Then in verse 5, we get a glimpse into how one is chosen and how the love of God is expressed in this process. We read, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. There's three important characteristics of this choosing process that God uses to bring one to Christ, to bring one to salvation. The first characteristic deals with the gospel. The gospel. Before the saints became saints, the gospel was presented to them. Paul, Silas, and Timothy delivered the gospel mention, the, the gospel message to these people. The gospel deals with God's plan to redeem a people for himself. 
It's a divine plan to save people from their sins. It includes the life and the teaching and the work of God, the Son, Jesus Christ. All of that's bound up in the gospel. Listen, in his letter to the church at Rome, Paul addresses the importance of the gospel. And quoting the prophet Joel, he states, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. In the next two verses, we find out how a person comes to a place where they can actually call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. Verse 14 says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Now, what, is, what Paul's doing here is he's starting at the end, calling upon the name of Christ, and then he moves towards the beginning of how all this process begins. He asks, how can someone call on the name of the Lord whom they don't believe in? Now, that makes sense, right? Taking this then another step backward, how can someone believe in someone that they had never heard about? Someone that they don't recognize. How can they do that? Moving another step backward, he asks, and how can someone hear about someone unless someone tells him? Do you see his logic? And then he arrives at the very beginning. How can someone tell others about the one on whose name they must call for salvation unless they are sent to do so? And then finally, Paul quotes another Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, by saying, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Okay? Starts at the end, works to the beginning. Now let's reverse the order and look at the beginning and go to the end. The good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a beautiful thing when someone brings good news to other individuals. It's a beautiful thing. Then someone can come to an understanding of who Jesus is. They can come to an understanding of what he has done. They can come to an understanding of what they themselves must do. And through this good news message, one recognizes a need, a need to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation. Because there's, there's salvation in no other name other than Jesus Christ. And then anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So the gospel is delivered, delivered by this team, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. The gospel that was entrusted to them, our gospel, they say, was faithfully delivered. Notice the second characteristic of this choosing process. We're told that this message was not simply a bunch of words. Not simply a bunch of words. It's a message of power. The power of the gospel is that it reveals the way to salvation. Again, in his letter to the saints at Rome, Paul declares this. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First, for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. It's the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes because it's empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the gospel would be nothing more than just a bunch of words. Just a bunch of words. I believe this to be true. I believe this to be true also because I've experienced this. I grew up in a religious family. I heard about the Godhead. I knew there's God the Father. I knew there's God the Son. I knew there's God the Holy Spirit. I heard how Jesus loved me and how he died for me. I heard how he rose from the dead three days after he was put to death. I, I heard about how he is in heaven waiting for us. I heard these words. 
but they were just a bunch of words to me. A number of years later, I heard many of these same words again. They were not new. Not new, but I heard them with new ears. I understood their meaning. I understood their importance. And then in my heart, I knew that they were true. And as such, I had to act upon them. I had to. What changed? The words? What was the difference? Well, the difference is this time that I heard these words. The Holy Spirit made these truths known to me in such a way that I had to respond. I had to. He empowered the gospel. Had it not been for the Holy Spirit, the saints at Thessalonica would not have received and believed in the gospel. After, after all, Scripture tells us that no one seeks after God. No one seeks after the, the truth of God. No one seeks after the things of Christ. That's why Jesus said, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. I have experienced these words from Jesus personally. And so did the saints at Thessalonica. The third characteristic deals with conviction. And I want to uh, address conviction on two separate but inter intersecting fronts. First, let's address the perspective uh, of what we had just talked about in regard to the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit opens up our eyes and our minds and our hearts to the truth of the gospel, it results in conviction. We see ourselves for who we really are. We are humbled as we stand exposed before a holy God knowing that we have fallen short of God's standards. We realize how lost we are in our sin and how much in need we are of redemption. And this moving in our heart, this deep conviction moves a person to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. The saints at Thessalonica believed the gospel that came to them, not because Paul was a craftsman when it came to using words, or because he was some kind of great persuasive speaker. He didn't talk them into believing the gospel. He truthfully delivered what was entrusted to him by the one who commissioned him. And he reminded the church about this when he said in verse 5, you know how we lived among you for your sake. Paul, Silas, and, and Timothy did not bring about deep conviction in the hearts of those who heard the gospel. It was the result of the Holy Spirit's power in the Holy Spirit's work. The other perspective deals with Paul's personal belief in the gospel and Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. He himself held to these truths with a deep personal conviction. And again, the saints at Thessalonica would have noticed this while the mission team lived with them as they ministered to the church. He said, you know how we lived among you for your sake. So even in that very brief time, the saints would have witnessed Paul's work produced by faith. They would have witnessed his labor prompted by love. They would have witnessed his perseverance that was inspired by hope in Christ Jesus. And so as a result, Paul commends them for becoming imitators, not only of them, but of the Lord. Now, I suppose there are circumstances in which imitation is not all that it's cracked up to be, right? I mean, some of the beverages that we drink have imitation color and imitation flavor and imitation sweetener. There are those who imitate Elvis. There are those who imitate Christians even though 
they themselves are not in Christ. So in today's scripture, being an imitator, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. They're imitating what they witnessed. They, they were imitating Paul's obedience. They were imitating Paul's service to Christ. They imitated Paul because Paul imitated Jesus. And in the brief time Paul, Silas, and Timothy were with them, those in the church were led not only in word, but also in deed. Not only was the church imitating Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they too were imitating Christ. In other words, they were, they were patterning their lives after the life of Jesus. And in this case, imitation is truly the highest form of praise. Churches everywhere, including our church, should be imitators of Jesus Christ. Am I right? Next in verse 6, Paul again commends the church for something. He recognized that in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. This is another reason why Paul can say that he knows the church is loved and chosen by God. He knows it. They received or embraced the gospel delivered to them with joy, even though they had to endure suffering because of it. I could be wrong, but over the past 50 years, it seems like persecution against the church has been on the rise in our country. In the last 10 years, Christianity in our country may have experienced more persecution than in the previous 40 years combined. And there's no reason to believe that this persecution will decrease in the future. In fact, it seems like to me that the opposite would hold true. Even so, I would be hard-pressed to believe that we who are Christians here in our country will face the kind of severe suffering that Paul mentions here in verse 6, even though we're not specifically told what this suffering was. But what we are told is, in spite of their suffering, they embraced the gospel with joy. With joy. Notice where this joy came from. They didn't work it up. It's not self-generated. It came from the Holy Spirit. In fact, Galatians 5 tells us that this joy is a spiritual fruit. And this fruit is obviously being developed in the church. Not only is it being developed in the church, it is visible for other people to see. They can see it. Now, perhaps you know a person or two who seems to have this need to call attention to himself or herself. You know anybody like that? I mean, they might point out qualities they feel that they have so that others could take notice. <sighs> or they might call attention to something that they have done so that others may notice and become impressed. There are some who seem to boast so that they can elevate themselves above other individuals. I know there's a lot of reasons that contribute to these factors as to why people do things like this, but the point is this. The church at Thessalonica did not do these things. They did not. They did not seek recognition. They did not purposely try to draw attention to themselves. They did not think more highly of themselves than they should, and they certainly did not try to place themselves on a pedestal for all to see so that you could be impressed. They simply lived out their faith for the glory of God. 
Paul commends them for this, for such a perspective, such actions have consequences, which he points out in verse 7. If received in humility, this commendation would be a great, great encouragement. Paul said, I'll get there. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Sometimes my thoughts and words go way ahead of my slides. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. I want you to notice this because the manner in which the church lived out their faith is significant. It resulted in them becoming a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Apparently, they didn't set out to become a model. They simply were imitators of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. What's even more important is they were imitators of Jesus Christ. That is what makes a church a model for others. I have delved into my fair share of church growth methods. And I think the church gets confused today because we have a tendency to seek after the right model or to seek the right methodology that will bring us the success that we are seeking. But what Paul's talking about in this verse has absolutely nothing to do with methodology. It has to do with the heart. It has to do with faith. It has to do with love. It has to do with hope. It has to do with living out your faith for the glory of God. Just as Paul's words were an encouragement for the church at Thessalonica, I think that they are every bit as much encouraging for you and I today because together we still make up the church locally, universally. If you are a believer in Christ who may be struggling through some kind of adversity, please hold tightly to the truth that in spite of what you are experiencing, in spite of what you may be feeling, you are loved by God. Say it to yourself. I'm loved by God. Give yourself a little hug. People may, in fact, people will let you down. Loved ones, family members will let you down. You may even feel as though your church has abandoned you. But let me reassure you, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are loved by God. And nothing, nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Because you are loved. Hold tightly to the truth that God has chosen you to be the object of his love, to be in a saving relationship with him according to his perfect will. This choosing is a clear example of how great his love for you is. Like a man and a woman choose to enter a marriage relationship with one another as a bride and groom, those of us who are in Christ are the bride of Christ. That's what the church is. The bride of Christ. What a unique relationship. God desires for our relationship to grow. He desires that our relationship with him may deepen. Therefore, we can hold tightly to the truth 
that the Holy Spirit will help us live out our faith. I don't have to do it on my own. I have divine help. You have divine help. Your salvation began through the Holy Spirit. It's being carried out by the Holy Spirit. And it will be brought to completion through the Holy Spirit. It's He who will help us bear the fruit of our faith, good works for the glory of God. It is He who will help all your labor, all your efforts be bathed in love. It is He who will help you fix your eyes on the blessed hope, that glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that you will continue to persevere until He comes. Finally, May today's scripture encourage you to be imitators of Jesus. Let him be the model of how we are to bring glory to God. He's our model of faith, hope, and love. He is our model of obedience. He is our model of how to serve God and serve one another. He's our model of humility. He's our model of perseverance. He is our church growth model. If you imitate him, like the saints at Thessalonica imitated him, you too will be a model to all believers. This I know, because that's what God's word says. Let's ponder these truths as we spend some time in prayer before the throne of grace, asking God to impress these truths upon our heart. Also, during this time, let's continue to pray for Patrick, who's still dealing with those crazy stones, and for Nolan, and for Caroline, and for Anna. Let's pray for one another as the Spirit leads.
gathering together with you to worship is the highlight of my week. And I'm kind of bummed that it's over. But before we dismiss, let's unite our voices in praise to God by singing Glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Let this not just be some words we sing. May that truly be the desire and actions of our heart as we leave this place today. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith.